yesterday's mission management team meeting in preparation for launch. Teams are proceeding toward a launch on Wednesday, November 16th during a two-hour launch window that opens at 1.04 a.m. Eastern Time. Here to give us an update on the countdown and launch operations as well as today's mission management team meeting are Jeremy Parsons, Deputy Manager for the Exploration Ground Systems Program at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and Mike Serafin, uh, Artemis One Mission Manager uh, from NASA Headquarters. Jeremy and Mike will share a few opening remarks and then we'll take questions. Reporters on the line can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Jeremy, we'll start with you. Good evening. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you for the folks that have interest on the call here. So um, per plan, the team was on console for call to stations at 1.24 a.m. this morning. Uh, countdown to, you know, so far is proceeding very well, and we are on schedule. So what have we been doing since the uh, discussion in the conference last night? So um, last evening, we powered up the vehicle. We ran a series of what we call um, program-specific engineering tests, or PSETs. It's basically integrated vehicle testing, and all was nominal. So uh, it was a very thorough check out of the vehicle. Everything is looking really good. Um, on the mobile launcher, we're getting panels and valves all configured for cryo loading. We filled the sound suppression and ignition over pressure tank, the big water tank out at the pad. And then uh, we've brought up power on Orion, the upper stage ICPS, and uh, core stage. So they've all been powered up at this time. And, um, and we're going to rain, remain with those up for the remainder of launch countdown. Um, we also have been working in troubleshooting of the J8 connector that was discussed last night. I'll give you a little bit more details on that in just a minute, but uh, before I do that, I'm going to go through what you can expect tonight and into tomorrow in terms of launch countdown. So tonight, we're going to begin charging all the flight batteries on the vehicle. Uh, we're going to get into pressurizing the core stage composite overwrap pressure vessels. We'll do final walkdowns tonight and through tomorrow and uh, we'll do a series of comm checkouts with Orion. Going into tomorrow, um, we pick up with our blast danger area clear at 12.04 Eastern. We get into air to, uh, air to GN2 switchover at 13.14. Uh, we clear out the entire launch danger area for all personnel at 2.04. And, uh, and then we get into uh, the new built-in hold at uh, 14.24, so that's at the T-minus 6 hour 40 minute mark. So when I say it's, it's new, it's the same built-in hold. Uh, previously it was 2 hours and 30 minutes. We have added an hour in for a cryo-loading concept of operations changes. Just a, kind of a quick level there. So we added an hour basically to do a slower, um, more gentle LH2 loading procedure. So it adds about 17 to 20 minutes for LH2 chill down and 32 minutes for fast fill. We're also now doing liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen loading in parallel. So uh, with all that, that, that picks up, again, that built-in hold picks up at 1424, and then we expect the launch director to give a go for cryo-loading at 1524. T0, as Catherine mentioned, is at 104 a.m., and we've got a two-hour window fully available to us. So um, real quick, and then I'll pass it over uh, to Mr. Serafin, um, the J8 connector. So team got in late last night. Um, we had already changed out the cable, done a series of ring out testing on that. Uh, we then changed out the ground receptacle side of this, and so that's on the back of the LH2 tail service mass umbilical plate. Um, we, we did that change out and then performed a series of retests. Team did a really good job ringing out all of the data, determining the risk posture, looking at all measurements flowing through there, where redundancy occurs, what launch commit criteria are associated with them. At a top level, you know, what we were basically seeing was uh, measurement transients during power-up, so they would go out of kind of expected ranges for a little bit when you first power up, and, and then they would come back into nominal ranges. Um, we are already in a powered up configuration on all of you know, the core stage ICPS and Orion, and we're going to remain in that configuration through the, uh, through the rest of launch countdown. So all of these are kind of at a normal, stable configuration. That being said, we went through each of these launch commit criteria that are associated with these measurements, determined criticality, redundancy, and what we call pre-planned contingency procedures, which is basically allows us to um, 
say we take failures on any of these measurements, say we know we have redundancy in these other measurements and uh, we are still okay to launch. The unanimous recommendation for the team was uh, we were in a good position to go ahead and proceed in the launch countdown with these measurements. And that was, again, based off the criticality and redundancy posture that we have. And really, we have a very robust system here uh, with a number of measurements in other areas. So with that, uh, Catherine, I'll turn it back to you. I believe that's kind of a summary of where we're at. Thank you, Rand. We'll go to Mike Saracen. Thank you. We'll go to Mike Saracen next. Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you again for uh, continuing to follow the Artemis program and the Artemis One mission. Um, this afternoon, we had a uh, launch minus one day mission management team meeting. Uh, the, the mission management team met for one and a half hours this afternoon, uh, and the primary purpose was to focus on two special topics. Uh, the first was the status of the uh, liquid hydrogen umbilical um, electrical connector uh, located at the J8 port that uh, Jeremy described, and, and we went through a status of the connector removal and replacement and the, uh, the work that was completed, um, any, any findings that, that we had as a result of it, and then the uh, post um, removal and replacement systems status checks. Uh, right now, as, as Jeremy described, we don't have any changes to our, um, our uh, posture as we head into the launch attempt. Uh, the the uh, launch commit criteria were, were reviewed and we agreed that the, the as written launch commit criteria um, were, were the uh, appropriate posture to have headed into the uh, the next attempt. And that's largely based on the fact that we have uh, systems redundancy as it pertains to the signals uh, that we need to verify as part of those launch commit. The other item that we talked um, was the one open action uh, that we took out of the launch minus two day uh, um, review uh, held yesterday. And that pertained to uh, the Orion um, room temperature vulcanization material or RTV material. Uh, delamination that we saw during uh, Hurricane Nicole um, on the east side of the vehicle or, or roughly in the, in the Orion coordinates, the 270 degree uh, location on the um, aerodynamic shell uh, called the ogive where that meets up with the uh, crew module adapter. Um, we had um, a, a strip of that uh, RTV uh, delaminate during the storm, uh, during the, uh, during the uh, windy portion of the storm. And uh, the, the purpose of that RTV is essentially to fill in the gap um, that exists between the, um, the, la the launch abort system ogive and the crew module adapter. There's a, there's a small area uh, that exists uh, where those two made up, uh, where we have an aerodynamic barrier, and um, it could actually cause a little bit of um, air circulation in there as, as we ascend through the Earth's atmosphere and cause aerodynamic heating. So to eliminate that little, uh, that little gap, uh, they put this uh, RTV material in there, and, and it just creates a, a very flush surface, a very uh, uh, streamlined aerodynamic surface. Uh, yesterday, when we um, reviewed the status of that uh, particular uh, uh, delamination that we observed and the likelihood of a reoccurrence uh, during flight, um, we uh, needed a little bit more time to review our flight rationale, and the team came back and we ex accepted that flight rationale today based on um, a, a proven methodology called the uh, seven elements of a good flight rationale. And we looked across the entire vehicle stack from the, um, from the Orion spacecraft all the way down uh, to the base of the stack, and uh, we agreed that the risk was bounded by uh, current hazards and hazard reports that we have out there um, well before, uh, that were established well before the agency flight readiness review and when we, ex when we um, accepted our risk baseline at the agency flight readiness review. So we went through that today and uh, we closed that action item and, and we accepted that flight rationale and it just was one of those circumstances yesterday where the team knew, needed a little bit more time to um, assess um, our, our overall risk posture and, and to um, understand this this new issue that had occurred earlier um, uh, or mid last week as a result of Hurricane Nicole. So uh, we went through that. Um, I asked if there were any dissenting opinions. There were none, and uh, we accepted that flight rationale. So that was uh, the purpose of today's uh, launch minus one day mission management team meeting. Uh, we are proceeding to the uh, next decision gate uh, to set up for the November 16th launch attempt, as Catherine indicated at the outset. 
so there's no change in, in our, our plan to, uh, to attempt to launch on the 16th. The next decision gate occurs uh, tomorrow afternoon at, uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon Eastern, and that's our tanking decision gate, and we'll get together again as a mission management team. So with that, um, that's, that was the outcome of our, of our meeting today, and uh, we look forward to uh, do, uh, the tanking tomorrow afternoon, and I'll pass it back to you, Catherine. Thank you. We'll now begin our uh, question and answer session and take questions from reporters on the line. Those on the phone can press star 1 to be entered into the queue at any time and press star 2 if you'd like to be removed from the queue. Um, your lines are on mute now and the operator will open and close your mic when we come to your question. Uh, please, address to, uh, please identify to whom your question is addressed and we ask you to please keep it to one question so we can get to as many reporters on the line as possible and if we have time we will do a second round of questions. We'll start with Kristen Fisher of CNN. <clears throat> uh, thank you both so much for taking our questions tonight. Um, two questions for you, and I'll try to keep them brief. I just want to make sure that I have it right in sort of, you know, layman speak. Would it be fair to say that these two issues that have given you guys some uh, trouble over the last 24 hours or so, the damage caused by the hurricane, that the, uh, <clears throat> the RTV material and this umbilical, uh, that those two issues have been fixed? Um, or that you all are just now comfortable with proceeding with them as is. Um, if you can just kind of give some clarification as to how we would we should refer to that, I would appreciate it. And then my second question is, if you, if each of you had to pick one moment in the countdown between now and liftoff that gives you the most uh, heartburn to think about, <laughs> uh, what moment would that be? Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, Kristen. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, in, in terms of the two issues that uh, that we reviewed today at the launch minus one day mission management team meeting, um, I would say that we're comfortable flying as is in both of those cases. Um, you know, we did uh, attempt to uh, fully resolve the electrical connector on the tail service mast umbilical, and uh, we're still seeing some funnies on that uh, particular umbilical. But but we reviewed. Um, the fact that we have uh, redundant uh, data um, that comes across that interface from the from the uh, rocket and the spacecraft to the um, to the ground side and and as well as the uh, delamination of this uh, RTV material um, and then uh, in terms of one moment that would give me the most heartburn between now and launch. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I haven't I haven't had time to think about that one. No, nothing immediately comes to mind. I, this is this is something that um, is uh, it's something we've been pre preparing for, and um, you know we've trained for. And and um, there's there are a number of decision gates that we have purposely to set up to uh, review our risk posture in the event that something changes, like like we saw here as a result of Hurricane Nicole. And um, and I see the team that's prepared to do that. So I, I, nothing comes to mind. I don't know, Jeremy, if you have anything to add to that. Well, kind of given uh, the white dress rehearsals for me, I'll, I'll probably breathe a bit of a sigh of relief after we get into LH2 fast, you know, slow fill to fast fill right in that time frame. Um, I feel very confident in the procedures that we've worked, but you know, that'll be one of those things where I think it'll be a big milestone once we really get and get into a steady state fill of LH2. And so. That'll be around, you know, 4, 4 p.m. or so tomorrow afternoon. And so that'll be something I think we'll all be watching closely. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Uh, Mike, um, I'm trying to get a better understanding of the RTV, um, comfortable flying as it is. Is it that you don't think any more might come off, or if it does come off, that it won't hit the rocket, or if it does hit the rocket, it won't do big damage? I mean, we're, we're, what's your thinking along the lines of um, risk in that regard? Thing? Yeah, Marcia, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, there there is a um, a small likelihood that uh, more RTB could come off the vehicle, uh, but we do have flight rationale that supports that. Um, in order to, to have a, um, an issue in flight, uh, first of all, we need uh, additional RTV to be released. Uh, and then it needs to impact part of the vehicle 
and that uh, vehicle element has to seek what we call critical damage, and there are limited components that could um, be exposed to that just due to what we call debris transport and where these these um, objects are relative to um, where the where the RTV would be um, liberated from. So we looked at we look at things like is this within our experience base? Um, are there self-limiting aspects of the um, of the this particular material and material release, and we do have self-limiting aspects, like the fact that it is it is going to tear um, because it is very pliable, and when it gets into the airstream, um, it's not going to come off as one really long piece. It will it will basically um, break into smaller pieces, and then um, we do know that this particular material has a very low lift coefficient when you look at it aerodynamically uh, because of how pliable it is. We actually had a witness uh, sample in the meeting today. Uh, it was about 12 inches long, and, and I believe that we've also posted uh, photos online of, of where we've lost the material um, for, the, for the general public um, to, to help understand um, you know, the, what the material looks like. And it, it is very thin. It is uh, relatively lightweight. And, and it is very pliable. And this, this low lift coefficient, the fact that we have a physics-based explanation, the fact that it has self-limiting aspects, the fact that we have an experience base of flying with this material, and, and not just on Orion, but with other programs. Um, it, um, RTV is a very commonly used aerospace material, but we also flew asset abort test number two. We flew ex exploration flight test number one. Uh, we had RTV in a very similar area. Um, uh, in both of those test flights, we did not see uh, material um, uh, at this same interface liberated uh, during during the uh, aerodynamic flight there. So uh, we we do acknowledge that there is a, um, a non-zero chance that we could have additional uh, liberation of RTV in flight, and and that there is a possibility that it could impact a different um, area of the vehicle downstream of Orion. We know what those areas are. We looked at it all the way down the stack. Uh, the most likely area to have uh, the RTB impact the Orion vehicle is on the, the launch vehicle stage adapter. And the launch vehicle stage adapter is a, um, a very tall conical feature that sits between the top of the core stage and the base of the interim crawl propulsion stage. And it, it literally takes the diameter of the Orion spacecraft and extends it out to the, the much larger diameter of the core stage. And just the fact that that uh, much larger area is there, that, that becomes the most likely area. Um, the LVSA is a very robust piece of hardware. It weighs about 10,000 pounds, uh, and it is used to translate the 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust at liftoff of the boosters and the, uh, the RS-25 engines up into the the um, the uh, upper stage, the interim crawl propulsion stage in the Orion spacecraft that sits above it. So it translates 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust up into um, a, a spacecraft that weighs over 70,000 pounds. And I don't remember the, the, the mass of the interim crawl propulsion stage, but, but you know, it, we're talking tens of thousands of pounds there as well. Um, so the, the launch vehicle stage adapter is a relatively inert piece of hardware, and that's the most likely um, it's it's simply a structural adapter, and that's the most likely area that it, that it could be exposed. But there are other areas that we looked at, um, again, because of the, uh, of, of the particular material type that, that we're talking here and other risks that we that we have um, disposition in the past or have in our in our hazards like ice and, and the thermal protection system on the core stage, um, we considered this to be bounded and within an acceptable range of risk. So that was our flight rationale. Thank you. Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Yeah, hey, thanks. I'd just like to follow up on Kristen's earlier que uh, question to Jeremy. Um, what, what do you think the odds are with, with or I don't know, I'm not asking you for odds, but how confident are you that when you get into fueling that you won't have to do manual adjustments like you've had to do in the past, you know, with pressure and flow rates and temperatures management? I mean, how confident are you you might be able to just load the fuel and go? Thanks. Yeah, hey, Bill, I appreciate the question. Um, and, you know, what I would say is we absolutely verified and validated these procedures 
um, during what we did was a taking test following launch attempt number two. And, and so what we did there is we spent a lot of time looking at uh, what is the environment around these quick disconnects, you know, what does the seal look like, what are the pressures we're putting on there, and then the associated leak rates. I would say at, at this point in time, uh, we are more confident than we have ever been in our loading procedures and how to do it in such a way that puts the least amount of pressure on the seals um, and, and to really try and keep it quiescent. The other thing is, is we have um, a purge can, right, basically around these quick disconnects where, you know, we try and remove, we purge it consistently with helium. And so, um, and we have haz hazardous gas measurements kind of coming through there. Um, we've talked with uh, all of our requirements and we're allowed to have, you know, a momentary transient as we, you know, up pressure uh, because, again, you don't have um, any, it would just be for a short time period. And, and that's really the worst case that we saw during uh, this tanking test was uh, you saw kind of a, a brief spike of, of hydrogen when you introduced, you know, more than a couple of PSI worth of pressure, and then it quickly came down. And so we've accommodated for all of that in our test procedures and in our safety requirements. So feeling pretty good right now about that kind of going into it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Nell Greenfield Boyce, Nell Greenfield Boyce of NPR. I'm just wondering how you all are feeling. You know, um, there was a huge amount of attention back in August, and then there were all kinds of things that have happened, you know, the faulty sensor, fuel links, Hurricane Ian, Hurricane Nicole, and, like, here you guys are again. Like, I'm just wondering, like, you know, Jeremy, um, you know, could you tell us, like, does it feel real now? Like, how? what's the feeling of the team? Is it like Groundhog Day? This isn't a very elegant question, but I guess you know what I'm asking here. I know it's a it's a good question. You know what what I'll tell you if I if I step back, what I feel is extremely proud of the resilience uh, of this team, and um, you know what I would tell you is we for all of us right it was it was a it was a bit of a a letdown when we had to roll back for Hurricane Ian. What I was so impressed with is the team turned around. You know we were kind of down that night. Then by the next day, everyone was super focused on what work we needed to do, what we needed to do get, to get back out at the pad. And, um, and then, you know, it was a similar story for Hurricane Nicole. By, you know, late afternoon, the day after the storm left, almost we had completed all walkdowns. We had completed imagery. Any issues were, were largely behind us. I mean, I, I will tell you the team is firing on all cylinders um, at this point. And so I just can't be more proud of them because I think if you would have asked me a couple of weeks ago, we would go through a storm like um, Hurricane Nicole and then be able to turn around and have cleared the vehicle and be in good shape. Um, I, I would have said, hey, chances are probably low, but um, this team has really just been firing on all cylinders. Yeah. And no, I would, I would add that um, the word perseverance comes to mind. Um, the team has had to persevere through numerous trials and that perseverance in turn has, has developed character in the team and and that gives me comfort that, that we're gonna be ready when it's when it's our time to fly. Um, as our administrator said, we'll we'll fly when it's right. Um, and administrator Nelson um, is is um, you know, he's he stands there with us understanding um, that uh, that we've gotta get this right. And um, in spite of the challenges that we've had, the hydrogen leaks and the storms and the other technical issues that we've had, um, the team has done a great job, and, and as Jeremy indicated, um, you know they've persevered through a number of situations, and, and our time is coming, um, and we hope that that is on Wednesday. Uh, but you know, if if Wednesday is not the right day, uh, we will take that next hurdle, that next trial, and we'll persevere through that. Thank you. Our next question is from Joey Roulette of Reuters. Hey, uh, thanks. I just had one follow-up on the RTV issue, I, I guess, for Mike Saracen. Um, what other risks does does this present that don't doesn't have to do with the uh, potential for debris hazard? Um, like, what does this, I guess, mean for the aerodynamics uh, during, you know, ascent? Um, what kind of forces are you guys going to ex expect to see now that a lot of the RTV is now gone? Thanks. 
Yeah, Joey, um, that is a good question. We did review um, the um, aerothermal and aero heating aspects of it, um, knowing that we had um, a, a portion of the RTB on the uh, currently east facing side of the uh, of the spacecraft. And because we already have an aerodynamic barrier that sits there, um, our, our um, aerothermal models and, and the analysis the team has done shows that um, there's not an issue there. This was just a way to um, reduce the aerodynamic um, turbulence and flow in that particular area, uh, but we're within our allowables. Um, in terms of, of other um, risks that, that we talked through, um, you know, that, that and, and debris liberation were the, were the two primary areas that we focused, and, and really nothing else comes to mind in terms of, um, you know, what we needed to address. It was just the, um, the debris liberation uh, flight rationale that we needed a little more time to go resolve. But all the other aspects of, of the risk were characterized yesterday. And, um, and and we understand that. So but I would say that that really covered the gamut. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Thanks. Uh, this is for Mike. Um, does the RTV issue change uh, the original loss of mission odds? I think you told us it was 1 in 125 back in August. And also uh, for Jeremy, uh, do any of the changes that you're making to the um, um, uh, to the fill affect the uh, 489 launch commit criteria? Any more? Any less? Thanks. Yeah, Irene. In terms of the uh, the lo the loss of mission or um, loss of mission number or the uh, one in 125, which is the the loss of vehicle number that was. Um, quoted earlier and we, and we assessed as our risk baseline at the, at the agency flight readiness review. Uh, again, if if you look at um, maybe a couple of decimal points past that 1 in 125, uh, there's there's probably a marginal increase in risk um, due to the potential for the RTB to be liberated and then um, hit a uh, follow a very specific trajectory and hit a very specific component and, and cause um, what we call critical damage, which would essentially result in loss of functionality. Um, we see that as a uh, low likelihood, but there is a, uh, a chance there. So in terms of changing uh, from 1 in 125, there's, there's no material increase there. But if, if you, you know, were to go several places after the decimal point, I'm, I'm sure there, there would be an increase. Um, but we, we consider that an acceptable um, uh, delta to the risk, and that is uh, the purpose of the mission management team is to review any changes from the risk baseline uh, uh, at the agency uh, flight readiness review, and, and we did that today knowing that we had um, the storm uh, cause some of this RTB material to come off, so we had to assess it from an aerodynamic and aerothermal perspective uh, knowing that we did not have this there, but then also um, went through the, the hypothesis that more could be uh, liberated during the ascent phase, uh, knowing that, that we had some um, nonconformances there from the storm. So uh, again, I would say there's there's no material change in that 1 and 125, and I'll, I'll let Jeremy answer the, next, the, the second part of your question. Okay. So <clears throat> Irene, in terms of LCCs, I, I will have to verify. I don't believe we've we changed any LCCs as a result of the loading procedure, but um, I will verify just so I'm not giving you kind of any any bad information at a top level, it doesn't it doesn't increase our risk posture. The the primary downside with you know kind of the longer LH2 loading procedure is just additional commodity usage, and uh, what we put into place was you know careful analysis to make sure we can get through the load, get through the full two hour window, and then we have a full replenishment schedule in place in the event of a scrub. And uh, so that's just basically orchestrating along those lines. And, and really, after a couple of those wet dress rehearsals um, and initial attempts, we have a very, very good feel for our models on commodity usage. And so that was the, the primary downside by extending that out. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. 
Uh, good evening. Question for uh, Mike Serafin. You mentioned the, the launch vehicle stage adapter is the most likely component that might be hit by any RTV material that uh, delaminates during flight. Um, what are examples of, of less likely but potentially more serious impacts? Are there other components that are more vulnerable to an impact that might cause them the critical damage that, while unlikely, you know, is, is potentially theoretically possible? Um, hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, yes, we did look at uh, less likely areas. Uh, again, if you if you look kind of nose on at the rocket as if it's literally flying right at you um, and you have this um, RTV at the nose of the rocket and um, a piece of it were to come off, uh, you need to look at the, the surface area that's, that's downstream and as, as a piece comes off, um, really the only area or time frame uh, that we're exposed to having enough energy uh, where uh, where the mass of any RTV, uh, if it were to follow a very specific trajectory and, and impact the vehicle downstream, um, is in the Mach 2 to Mach 3.5 range, or about 80 to 100 seconds in the flight. So now, if you look, if you look at it. That's your narrow window of exposure where you have enough energy, where the rocket is accelerating fast enough, but there's enough atmosphere to slow down anything um, that comes off um, enough that you have enough impact energy. Um, the, the areas from highest probability to lowest probability were on the launch vehicle stage adapter, simply because it is a large diameter change from, from the diameter of the, the, the spacecraft to the diameter of the core stage. The, the next most likely area were the um, the inner uh, areas of the boosters, the solid boosters, um, and when I say the inner area, the, the, the areas that are closest to the um, to the core stage, because if, if you're looking at the far side of the boosters, the, the ones that are uh, pointing away from the core stage, there's, there's no um, risk of this RTV impacting the booster. Um, so booster was considered moderate relative to the LVSA. And then the core stage and the uh, interim crowd propulsion stage were seen as low probability. Um, there were some specific areas on the interim crowd propulsion stage uh, that we looked at, specifically the systems tunnels uh, that are small aerodynamic protrusions where we run some wires and cabling up the sides of the um, of the stage. And then similarly for the uh, for the uh, for the core stage, there's uh, cable trays and and some some systems tunnels there. Um, the boosters uh, were considered moderate uh, probability, um, mostly because of um, some very specific areas, uh, the, uh, the um, separation uh, motors at the very base of the, uh, of the booster um, that, uh, that are used to provide the, uh, the separation function. So, uh, those were the areas that we looked at. Um, all of those, uh, again, were enveloped by by other known debris sources and other uh, hazards and risks that we had had. Um, we just needed a little bit of extra time um, to take this previously um, uh, or the the, the RTV uh, delamination that we saw from the storm that we and we wanted to verify that that was within our experience base, and, and we did that today. So I hope that answers your question. Hey, just uh, one quick go back for Irene. I did verify there was no changes to any LCC as a result of the, the LH2 loading procedures. Thank you. Our next question is from David Curley of the Discovery Channel. Thank you very much. Mike Serafin, um, we've been doing these calls for 18 months now. Um, we've gone to the green run. We've gone to tanking tests a couple of launch attempts, a couple of storms, um, hydrogen leaks. It, it seems, and this is a terrible question to ask an engineer, and I'm sorry, it, it seems like you're in a good spot. What does your gut tell you? Are you going? Uh, David, uh, I'll know the answer to that question, uh, you know, in the early hours of um, – of Wednesday the 16th if we're, if we're going to go um, we are going to set up and we're going to do our best and we're going to try on on um, on Wednesday um, that said if 
if we have an issue that occurs that would cause us um, to meet one of our no-go criteria, it, it may not be our day. Um, as I've discussed before, uh, we really have three buckets of, of uh, criteria that could cause us to be no-go. Our launch commit criteria, our technical must-meet criteria, the 489 launch commit criteria. We have range safety criteria in the interest of public safety. Um, and, if, and if we had somebody out there or a situation that um, there was a, a, a range safety risk that, that was not handled or managed, uh, we may have to halt. And then weather um, relative to uh, meeting our weather criteria. Um, on Wednesday, we have a very favorable weather forecast. Um, we've seen very weather, favorable weather forecasts turn into no-go conditions in the past. I hope that's not the case, but we've also seen very poor weather forecasts turn into a go and, and launch. So, uh, you know, I, 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 the answer to your question is like trying to predict the weather or predict, you know, uh, whether we're, we're not, uh, we're going to meet all these um, these technical criteria. Uh, we're going to go when it's right, uh, but we're going to give it our best shot on Wednesday, and, uh, and we're set up to do that. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, all the all the systems line up, the weather lines up, and the range lines up, um, but but we're not going to commit this vehicle until it's time. Thanks. Our next question is from Chris Gebhardt of NASA Space Flight. Uh, hi. Yes. Um, one, uh, two quick questions here. From the fueling test on September 21st, you allowed the ambient LH2 concentration limits to go up to as high as 10% with with really strict monitoring on that. Um, and, and I'm wondering if that's the case for Wednesday, or if the limit is back to 4% with the option to increase back up to 10% for troubleshooting purposes, since you have the data from the September test on that. And and then also back to the RTV issue. I guess I'm having trouble wrapping my head around this. If if Nicole, with winds of 75 miles an hour, liberated this, doesn't that tell you it would have come off as as soon as the local airstream reached speeds greater than 75 knots? And and how does that factor into the discussion of a low chance of more RTV liberating? Um, G given the, the speeds that SLS will be accelerating through the dense lower atmosphere at. Thank you. All right, Chris. So to answer your first question, um, yeah, we're going to – so that 10 percent is within the purge can around the, the quick disconnects where we actually, you know, do the fueling of the liquid hydrogen. Um, and so we are going to keep those same constraints that we put on there for September 21st. And so that 10 percent isn't a, you know, remains at 10 percent, it would be, again, kind of that transient. As you increase pressure, you might see a small spike of LH2 that quickly comes down. And, uh, and so rather than have it automatically go into a revert flow, uh, stop and revert flow sort of condition, uh, again, we are going to allow that 10 percent for a small period of time until the pressure kind of equalizes. So we are going to keep that in there. And, and I, I think we found that that is going to be beneficial. And uh, Chris, as it pertains to the um, the RTV uh, delamination from from tropical or Hurricane Nicole, uh, with winds that were you know 70-ish knots relative to the uh, the launch profile, um, we have flight experience flying Orion um, both on uh, on ground test or, or, or suborbital test as well as an orbital test, um, exploration flight test one. I was the lead flight director for, and we launched a, an Orion spacecraft up to 3,600 or 3,600 miles above the Earth. We did not see anything like this on that flight. Um, and then on ascent abort test two in in 2019, um, which was a um, a test of a um, an Orion uh, launch abort system with with this same interface, uh, we did not see any any material um, come off. Um, we have to remember that as we launch a, a rocket, we go from one atmosphere on the ground, so the air is very dense at, at the at sea level, and the farther you rise up through the atmosphere, it gets less and less dense. And and by the time um, you get to you know 30 to 40 thousand feet. You have enough air up there to support a uh, an aircraft that can cruise at, at um, 
cruising altitude, but when you get much more above that, it's really hard for anything um, to uh, to fly aerodynamically, and you, and you have to have a highly specialized aircraft there. So that means your aero, your atmospheric density uh, gets very low, and when you when you map the atmospheric density against the speed of the vehicle, um, you know th- that shows that we have a a narrow window of of risk relative to um, any additional material that could come off of this RTV if it were to delaminate. But the fact that um, we have the other roughly 270 degrees of the of the 360 degree um, uh, circumference of the spacecraft out there where we haven't seen any issues from the coal, we have the flight experience, um, we do have um, flight rationale that supports even if more material were to come off, um, and, and and again, there's there's a small probability that more material could come off, but not all of it's going to come off. Um, that that that's why um, we're not we're not uh, particularly concerned with the uh, the risk profile here because it's enveloped by other other experience that we have. Thank you. Our next question is from Micah Maidenberg of the Wall Street Journal. Hey there. Um, hey, Mike, could you just briefly, could you remind me about the advantages of using liquid hydrogen um, as, a, as a fuel uh, for, for space launches, you know, in combination with liquid oxygen? Um, you know, I've done various research and interviews and so forth, but can, just for all the discussion, you know, we've been having over the last few months about it, just re- remind me, like, why, what are the advantages of it? Why, why NASA is using it here? Jeremy, you want to take a crack at this one? I mean, so from a from a ground perspective, right, liquid hydrogen can be uh, slightly more difficult. What this vehicle has been absolutely optimized for is putting mass into lunar orbit, right? And so that's what you get with liquid hydrogen is, is very um, robust performance in getting mass around the moon. And so, you know, this vehicle was designed uh, for deep space exploration, it wasn't designed to put satellites or vehicles into low Earth orbit. It was designed um, for a kind of deep space exploration. And so what you get with liquid hydrogen is, is the best performance around that, uh, along with a lot of history on the RS-25s. So, Mike, that's kind of my, my initial take. Yeah, yeah no, I, th- I, th- I think you hit it, Jeremy. Um, you know, liquid hydrogen is, is uh, or hydrogen is the smallest um, material on the atomic chart, um, but it has incredible performance um, or, or energy density um, when you compare it uh, on a mass perspective. How, how much how much um, does your fuel source weigh compared to the amount of energy stored in it? And that's why hydrogen is, is the, uh, is the uh, primary benefit. Thank you. Our Next question is from Lucy Aborge of AFP. Hi, thank you. Um, just a quick question on the status of the CubeSats, the 10 CubeSats. We were told that five of them were recharged and that the others couldn't. So just just decide the time pass, do they all have a chance for a successful mission? Like, Can you just confirm that they all had a shot at achieving their mission? Thank you. Um, hi, Lucy. Uh, Mike Seraphin. Yeah, we we did um, pop off the batteries on four of the ten CubeSats uh, during the the rollback to the vehicle assembly building. Um, and in terms of uh, battery state of charge, uh, there is one CubeSat um, that we know has a a low state of charge that may um, impact its ability to achieve its mission. And uh, the other ones all have um, sufficient state of charge that um, of, of the of the ten um, where we expect them to meet um, full mission duration. So we did look at that as part of our flight readiness review, uh, and then uh, most recently as part of the uh, our, our um, Delta launch readiness review. And um, there's only the one that that we're concerned with. Um, which is a, a science 
uh, mission that's that's looking to map the um, the lunar volatiles um, around the uh, around the moon. But the rest of them, we we expect to have a uh, adequate um, state of charge on the batteries. Thank you. Our next question is from Jim Siegel of NASA uh, TechNet. Uh, thank you for taking my question, and forgive me if you've covered this topic in a prior uh, news conference, but I, I'm curious about the content or the cargo in the Orion spacecraft, and was there an attempt to add to the weight of Orion so that it would be about the same when it was launched with uh, with crew? Thank you. Yeah, Jim, uh, thanks for your question. Um, we have a, a slightly lighter Orion spacecraft um, than we will have on a crewed flight because we don't have the crew plus all their gear, but we do have mannequins or moonikins as we've called them. Um, uh, three of the four seats have um, uh, mannequins in them and um, they mimic the, uh, the weight and, and seating locations of uh, three of our four crew members, so we're missing our fourth crew member from a, a mass standpoint. But also all the stowage, uh, that, you know, the food, the clothing, all that other um, materials that, that astronauts would normally take with them, we do not have. Uh, we, that said, we do have uh, a series of mass simulators in the vehicle. We do have a series of payloads that we're going to round trip in the Orion spacecraft. We have a bio uh, technology experiment that, that we're going to uh, round trip. Um, with uh, a number of, of organisms that we've we've shared the content online about, um, we do have a, a technology demonstration payload that we're flying in the cockpit uh, called Callisto um, that, that we're excited about in terms of having essentially a, a hands-free cockpit. Um, we do have um, active and passive uh, radiation dosimeters uh, that we're going to gather data on to help inform. The uh, the flight environment is as we fly out of the uh, low Earth orbit, which is uh, enveloped by the Earth's magnetic field, and fly out um, through the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts, where we have um, concentrated areas of radiation uh, from deep space, and then out uh, into the deep space in environment where we do not have any um, shelter from the Earth's magnetic field. Fly about the moon and then return and return back through the Van Allen radiation belts and then back um, into the Earth's magnetic field. We're going to gather baseline data on what our astronauts are going to experience. Um, so we we do have a number of of payloads um, and and uh, science experiments that we're that we're going to um, uh, use as we go along. We also have um, what we call the official flight kit, where we are round tripping. Um, certain artifacts, um, either that, that are representative of our uh, partnerships, and we've shared that information online as well. Um, you know, we, we have our, um, our, uh, our uh, zero-G indicator, um, uh, Snoopy, uh, through our partnership with the, uh, the uh, Schultz Foundation, uh, who have been um, staunch advocates of our um, of our space flight program. I wore my silver Snoopy this week uh, to our uh, launch readiness review. Um, as a symbol of uh, flight safety. So there, we do have Silver Snoopies on board this vehicle, um, and it will be quite a privilege to receive one of the Silver Snoopies um, as a, a sign of um, uh, support for uh, flight safety to anybody that gets a, uh, a Silver Snoopy that's been around the moon. So those are some of the uh, uh, content and cargo on board the flight and, and some of the reasons that the spacecraft's a little bit lighter um, but is certainly representative of, of what we expect to fly on future flights. The spacecraft weight is right around 70,000 pounds. This is a, a big, heavy spacecraft. Um, after we jettison the launch abort system, the, the spacecraft weight uh, will be about 58,000 pounds, and then what will splash down the ocean will be right around 20,000 pounds. So we got a, we got a big Orion. Thanks. Our next question is from David Denault of About Space Today News. Mike, I, I I may have missed this somewhere, but I you know the, the rocket was facing obviously in the eastern direction, so you had the direct wind hit. How much of the spacecraft was we're we talking uh, three feet or maybe some meters? How much of that was actually lost? And my second follow-up on this: if this were a critical issue, 
and you had to roll back as a VAB, you said this would take a lot of extra time for this material. If you had to do the whole spacecraft, how long would that take? Uh, yeah, David, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of how much of the, the RTV material was lost at the at the pad as a result of Hurricane Nicole, um, it, it was uh, isolated to the windward side, so the direction that the wind was blowing from, um, which was basically facing the beach um, or the eastward direction. Uh, if you're looking at it from the Orion coordinate system, it, it was uh, kind of centered on the 270-degree location. Um, it was a in total, it's about a 10-foot long strip. We know that it was not released all at one time. We, we have video of, uh, confirming that, um, that it, that it um, because of the pliability of the material and, the, and, and again, because it has a, a very low lift coefficient, um, that it has self-limiting aspects and it, and it literally uh, tore off in little strips as the wind grabbed it and, and created a little bit of lift. So we know in total it was about, about a 10-foot strip that, that was released in pieces. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, how long it would take, um, I, I don't remember commenting on how long it would take. We do not have access in, at the uh, launch pad to, to repair this particular location, um, but it would take the time to roll back, gain access in the vehicle assembly building, time to apply the material. It also requires a curing, kind of like, um, you know, when you, when you put caulk or paint up, it, it requires time to dry. Um, and then we would have to roll, uh, remove access and then roll back out to the launch pad. So, so there is a finite amount of time it would take to do this. Um, that really did not factor into the uh, the flight rationale or risk risk acceptance discussion. Um, the, uh, the the risk acceptance was was strictly based on do we understand what's going on here and uh, do we have flight rationale. Thanks. We've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, we'll take the next one from Jim McKenna of Aerospace Tech Review. Thank you. Um, this one is from Mike. Uh, the leak on the LH2 line uh, the last time, if I recall correctly, was caused by a uh, uh, valve command error that led to the line getting overpressurized to 60 PSI. Uh, what has been changed in the procedures to prevent an occurrence of that type? Yeah. Um, hi, Jim. I'll I'll start, and Jeremy can add um, any anything here that I that I may have missed. But uh, we don't know definitively that um, the uh, inadvertent overpressure of the liquid hydrogen line at the uh, start of uh, launch attempt number two. Uh, we don't know definitively. Uh, that that was the cause of the liquid hydrogen leak at the 8-inch quick disconnect. Um, what we do know is that when we demated uh, and reviewed the the, um, the seal at that quick disconnect, that there was evidence of well, we, we know that there was an indentation on the uh, on the seal, and it was consistent with either ice or foreign object debris. We did not find foreign object debris, um, and and. We did run a, um, a fault tree to assess potential causes of the hydrogen leak and um, moisture, uh, ice, uh, foreign object debris, and then what we call thermal shock. We're on the, uh, on the root cause, um, uh, but we could not get to a definitive root cause. Uh, that said, uh, we did implement uh, some procedural um, actions and, and corrective actions, as well as um, uh, trained and uh, some additional automation of the software uh, associated with the uh, hydrogen loading operation. So we, we looked at all the potential causes. We, we mitigated them to the extent that we could uh, through things like removal and replacement of the quick disconnect, um, you know, inspection for foreign object debris. Uh, we wiped down the surfaces. We automated the uh, the loading operation to the extent possible. We improved some of the training, um, but again, we could not definitively say what the root cause was. I don't know, Jeremy, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, the, the console operator in this case, I mean, he was very experienced, incredibly proficient at what he was doing. Um, you know, what we had done is between launch attempt number one and number two, uh, we had changed a number of the procedures, and going into that, you had to do a number of commands all at a time. 
what what we've done since then, because again that increases possibility of of error, is um, we basically put controls where um, on the command console you basically can only command one of those things at a time, and everything else is locked out. Um, and so that goes along with the procedure. And so they've done a, a really good job going through, uh, eliminating possibilities for you know basic error along those lines. Uh, when you're sending a bunch of commands, and then they've they've essentially automated the vast majority of it. Um, we're also, you know, again in this case, you know, when when that command was sent, we didn't violate the, you know, the what we call ICD or essentially the the requirements specifications for that specific CD. But you still did get a pressure transient, and so what we're really focusing on and what we validated during the um, the tanking test was kind of a, a very slow, uh, methodical raising of pressure um, incrementally over a long period of time that then really decreases any of those pressure transients on the, the quick disconnects. And so, again, that, that was validated, uh, and we're utilizing the same procedures that we did on that September 21st test. Thank you. We probably have time for just one more question. Um, we'll take a question from Ken Kramer of Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for doing this, and good luck with the launch. Um, I would like to ask about the uh, rolling back the uh, ro ro rolling back Artemis. Can you talk about? You said it was riskier to uh, to roll it back and and have it on the ground versus um, being on top of the pad. Why is it more risky on the ground rolling it back versus uh, or stopping there versus having st keeping it on top of the pad? Thank you. And it's a it's a good question. So I think kind of one way to start is that the analyzed loads seen during Hurricane Nicole were less than what the vehicle sees during a roll out and roll back. Um, and so kind of at a at a top level, those are some of the higher load cases um, on the vehicle whenever you roll in and roll out. And so, um, so that was one thing. The, there was a couple of things in the decision. Um, we are single string on the crawler transporter, which means you basically only have one crawler transporter. While it is very robust and we have spares and we have a number of things along those lines, if we began to roll back and winds were expected to pick up within, you know, I, I don't remember the exact time frame, but there was a window where, um, where the winds weren't expected to be high, but then they quickly picked up. So if you rolled back and then you know you had a shoe on the crawler fail or a propeller motor or something like that, you know there is a there was a not insignificant chance that you could be on the crawler way when winds exceeded your requirements or lightning rolled in, and um, and again when you kind of looked at what were the worst case expected conditions out at the pad versus you know, potentially being stuck in the crawler way, those were some of the decisions involved in the risk trade there in terms of writing it out. We did look very carefully at, you know, what were the worst expected conditions and uh, and ensured we were well within our design envelopes for, for all of those cases. Yeah, Jer Jeremy, I think you said it really well. Um, okay, Ken, obviously the, the best place to be in a storm is in the VAB. Um, the second best place is at the pad. Um, the worst place to be is stuck out there on the crawler way. And, and um, you know, as Jeremy outlined, um, you know, we, we had a risk versus risk trade. And there was some uncertainty in the forecast. Um, and we know that the loads that the vehicle could handle by design at the pad, um, just is sitting there at the pad hard down, um, are higher from a wind standpoint than if we're rolling because you need to account when you're rolling, you need to account for the loads. Uh, the, the analogy that that, we, that we've discussed is just kind of like, you know, being in a pickup truck going down a bumpy road. Um, when when you're when you're on the crawler way, you do impart loads on the rocket. Um, granted, you aren't moving very fast, but there are loads there, um, and you need to subtract that out from any wind conditions that you're going to see and and the the winds that were forecast at the time, um, to the time that we could roll back in that in that time frame, um, were in the range that 
we thought we had more more, more margin from a uh, vehicle structure standpoint, uh, staying at the pad and riding it out, than than rolling back. And if we rolled back, we would be accepting the risk that we could have a problem with the crawler transporter um, during that time frame and be stuck out there on the crawler way and not make it back to the vehicle assembly building. And and it sounds like a relatively simple and relatively straight, straightforward thing to do, but it is not. This crawler transporter, if you've ever walked up to it and seen it in person, you feel very, very small. And that is without the rocket, 30, 32 stories sitting on top of it, um, or with the mobile launcher. The mobile launcher itself weighs 11 million pounds. The rocket's dry weight is a little over 2 million pounds. Too. So when you roll the entire stack, the mobile launcher, with the uh, Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System on, rocket on it, on the crawler transporter, you've got tens of millions of pounds going across the ground. And, and again, it was a risk on risk trade. It was not an easy decision. Um, it was, it was a, um, you know, a fairly um, long discussion that we, that we talked about. And uh, we did not take that decision lightly, but those were some of the factors that went into it. Thank you. That is all of the time that we have for questions today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online shortly by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis-1. And uh, join us tomorrow for our launch coverage, which begins with NASA television coverage of tanking and commentary from inside the Launch Control Center beginning at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. And you can follow along at our blog for updates about the mission as well at blogs.nasa.gov slash Artemis. With that, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your participation, participants. You may disconnect at this time.